y'all, Anita here. One of the best things about being on the 2018 Joko Cruise was getting the chance to sit down on a giant boat and talk to some amazingly creative people. I hope you enjoy listening to these special conversations as much as I loved having them. We're releasing one a week as a special bonus for you amazing listeners. And remember, we do need your help to keep making this podcast, so please consider joining our podcast community for exclusive perks and bonus content at d.rip slash femfreak. This week's interview is with actor, comedian, and writer John Hodgman. You probably recognize him from The Daily Show, his in-depth sociological taxonomy of hobos, and his provocative role-playing a PC, which you'll hear in the interview I completely forgot about. Um, to hello. put this in context for those of you <laughs> <laughs> listening at home, my name is John Hodgman. I'm here with Anita. Would you pronounce your last name for me? Sarkeesian. Sarkeesian was if what I was going to say. If you want to be really say. Armenian about it, you would say Sarkeesian. Sarkeesian. But you don't Anita need to Anita Sarkeesian in an interior stateroom aboard the MS Osterdam, <laughs> speeding northward along the coast of Baja, California, to make port tomorrow morning at the, to finish the Jonathan Colton cruise, February 24th, 2018, at approximately... 1100 and hours and three minutes. <laughs> it is, we have, we have no internet on this ship or no, no internet to speak of. And it's so we shall not speak of it. Yeah, exactly. And Anita has just acknowledged that she doesn't know anything about me. <laughs> Could not Google to get information ahead of time, which leaves me. In addition to all of my baked-in advantage as being a cis, straight, white male uh, of, uh, of upper, upper middle class uh, uh, background, uh, I also have the advantage that I can now make anything up and say that it's true about me. Perfect. I, I all love those that. things I are true. I can just let you keep talking. I don't even have to be here. I can just walk out of the room and you just keep monologuing. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's that's true. <laughs> um. Yes. I am. I think so. In in the convention world, they call it con crud, which I think is disgusting when you get the sickness passed around. Oh yeah. I don't know what they call that on a cruise. Cruise crud. Norovirus. Yeah. Great. Yes, that I is. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that is there. There is. So, are you feeling sick? A little bit. A little oh. Bit. I'm. I, we are at a far distance on right. the table. And we and the Jonathan Colton organization was wise to set up a podcasting station on this cruise because there are many podcasts being recorded here. Nobody's <clears> using <throat> this room except for me. Oh, is that true? <laughs> yeah. I should have said I should be doing. So, among other things, I host a podcast called the Judge John Hodgman Podcast. Why have I never been on it? Well, it, because I'm totally kidding. No, but it, it's it's uh because uh, we've we very rare, just met. We've no, I'd be very uh, very happy to. In fact. You know, there are some if if I had known of you earlier, we've had some video gaming disputes. Oh, I could solve those that, disputes for you. That you would have it would have been great to have you in as an expert witness, which we do from time to time. But my podcast, the Judge John Hodgman podcast, does not really have a lot of known public persona guests. We have real people non public persona people. <laughs> I'm not real people. No, you're real people. Look, <laughs> no one's really off to a really no one's realer start. than you. Yeah. You're, you're always real people to me. All right, but you know, but uh, now see, but I was going to say, oh, I yeah, also, yeah. you know, even though they've kitted this place out with a lot of microphones, <clears throat> no cough button, no cough button. Oh no, there's no cough button, which is absolutely needed on this ship. Yes, that was a very because cru- cru- cruise crud is going around. Cruise crud. Which yeah. is so gross. Whoever came up with that name is a disgusting. You know human what's being. gross? Cons. Yeah. Yeah. There's they a sure lot. Are. I mean, I say that with great affection. Yeah. But uh, we both attend them. Yeah, like a lot close quarters. People uh, who don't bathe very often. Yeah. Well, you know, share, shared interests make up for. <laughs> share, share, hygiene. Intense shared interests <laughs> seem to make people feel that hygiene is no longer necessary. It's weird because how that it's happened. family. You feel like it's family, and yeah, after so when, a while, when I see my family, I just stop showering. That's how that goes. Right? Like so we, it feels. Yeah. We just don't have showers in my parents' house. Today, every day on this cruise, there's a. I, I gather there's some sort of wardrobe theming if people yeah, want. Yeah, there's something like that, right? Like so there was a cosplay day. day. Yeah, p- cosplay pajama day. day. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, being the noted wag that I am, I said to myself, I said to myself and my wife, who was in the cabin at the time, but mostly for myself, I said, <laughs> well, apparently the nerds are dressing in their pajamas today. I wonder if anyone will notice the difference. <laughs> 
because we're a comfy clothing crowd. We are a comfy clothing crowd. Yeah. I feel like the whole, like, you know, I'm I'm games and tech adjacent, right. and um, there's very much this, the the casual aesthetic, which part of me really likes yeah. that you can, like, it, you don't have to be stuffy and wear a suit every day and, like, no. heels and all that crap. No. But every time, every now and again, if I go to a party and I want to, like, dress up, it's just super weird because, one, I'm a woman. Right. And then also I'm wearing something nice and I'm like, oh, no, that just, is just weird. You you mean to say that you are the you are the only one who is dressed up? Generally. Generally. Me if you do, maybe one other person. Right, because, yeah, yeah in, the, in, the, in the tech world, yeah. it's a, it's a, Dress down aesthetic. It is a dress down. T shirts and jeans. T shirts and jeans. Yeah, no, I'm now that I'm in my mid forties, I'm I am loving the new dress down aesthetic. I wear <laughs> I wore a suit throughout my thirties and early forties. Did you actually? That was my public brand was oh. to wear a suit. See if on, I had the internet I would know that. On the daily show, I used to appear on the daily what show. Is the daily show. Yeah, I know, right? But, but <laughs> we I assume we forget. <laughs> Trevor Trevor's daily show is amazing, I have to say, and it now does feel like a distinctly different show, which yeah, was, sure. you know, a necessary evolution. Well, okay, hold on. Let's yeah. as as long we could riff forever sure. with these great cruise jokes. Um, but so I think that a lot of folks do know you from the Daily Show. That's sure. My, is it fair to say that's one of the highest profile? Oh, for sure. Done? Okay. Yeah. That's also my yesterday on stage. You talked about being in Pitch Perfect too, and I was like, Oh, really? When was that? What what scene was that? I was in the riff off. <laughs> the riff off, which yeah. is the best scene to be in. Yeah, I was there. one of the tone hangers. That's awesome. Jason Jones and I and Reggie Watts and Joe Latrulio and Adam Devine. We were the tone hangers. That was amazing. I have the worst memory on the planet. So I was not I on screen would for. Never a, remember that. I was not on screen but, for a while. But lot you are time. an actor and a comic, and you. I would like you to yes. introduce yourself in the things that you do. It's I I uh, yeah I there are question marks after every occupation. Um, so to give you some background, and for those who are listening who don't know who I am, which is probably a lot, I started as a writer uh, for magazines, and then I was writing humor for an internet website called McSweeney's, which is also a print journal. Um, uh, was encouraged by Dave Eggers to write comedically because uh, I thought I was supposed to write serious short stories about feelings. Um, really enjoyed writing comedically. That grew into a book of fake facts uh, that I wrote in 2005 before it was popular to write fake facts. I was <laughs> I was out there. It was ahead of my time. I went on The Daily Show to promote that book, which was called The Areas of My Expertise, in which I presented as straight white male authority saying insane things. That was sort of the, the gag of the book. Um, and the gag of the book was, it was like invented trivia, invented history, presented as though it were real. And so, like, I was inspired by a book called The Book of Lists, which was a big bestseller in the 70s. You would find it in everybody's bathroom. It was just lists of interesting facts, like the nine U.S. presidents who, you know, uh, uh, smoked cigars or something. Okay. But I would do the nine U.S. presidents who secretly had hooks for hands, and I would tell the story about <laughs> yeah. how they each had a secret hook for a hand. And very straight-faced deadpan. That's why I would wear a suit all the time because I was presenting as white male authority before they even had a word for white male authority. That was just default personhood at the time. Sure. But now, yeah. Yeah. Uh, now I realize how much of the gag was playing off of my... Yesterday I um, attended a panel um, of comedians sort of teaching how to do comedy. Right. And Cameron Esposito on the panel said a line that I actually wrote down about um, how men are the tour guides of the universe. Oh. And I really liked that phrasing of talking about how male is the default and male experiences are um, just like the human that's experience. Yeah, yeah. That's but I, I liked that. That was very poetic phrasing. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a beautiful phrase for sure. Yeah. And so I went on The Daily Show to promote that book. And John Stewart, then the host of the show, and I, you know, clicked during the interview and um, I was invited back to be a contributor on the show, oh. um, which was yeah. not what I saw coming. I did not see anything coming, honestly. So, question. Um, so, you started in writing. Yeah. And uh, you were encouraged to do comedy. Like, you you didn't grow up being like, I'm a funny guy. No. I I mean, uh, I knew that I was funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I my my initial... Yeah, no, I th I thought that I wanted to be a, a serious person. Sure. And so, uh, you know, I, oh. I moved to New York after I went to college, and I got a job at a literary agency and started writing for magazines on the side. And then 
and I was, you know, I, I wrote serious short stories and stuff. And then when I quit that job to write full time, um, my friend Mark Adams, who was an editor at Men's Journal, which is, you know, the most famous magazine about men writing in journals. <laughs> <laughs> One of our passions. Yeah, yes. yes. <laughs> Uh, I'm excluded from that. Yeah, oh, it was not, it's not really for you. You wouldn't no, understand. I wouldn't. But, it's go over my head. Yeah, no, it's a magazine about, uh, you know, notebooks you can buy. <laughs> <laughs> that are for men. For men. Yeah. Leather-bound yeah. men's journals. Women's journal is the women's journal version of I've never that. heard and of it. And it's pink. Ladies home journal. <laughs> Ladies, yes, and it's pink. Yeah. Right. And glittery. Yeah. Uh, no, but the Mark Adams that invited me to write about um, uh, food to do a food column for the magazine, which I was totally into because I love food history and stuff. So, and I started writing and he's like, why isn't this funny? I'm like, what are you talking? <laughs> he's like, you're a funny person. Like, that's a funny line that you wrote. I'm like, oh yeah. He said, you do that. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, but I thought it was supposed to be like, I, I guess I was, it was not like I was ponderous and serious, but I was like clever or interesting was more important to me. Yeah. And Mark was like, you, you know, you're, you're funny and you, you you don't realize it, but not everyone is. Yeah. So you should use it because people that's valuable. So and you, I and I had never thought about it. Yeah. In those so terms. do you think of yourself as a comic now, or like a comedic actor, or um, like I I it's I don't really know. Yeah. I mean, I I usually write on tax forms and stuff. Writer and performer. I'm <laughs> not. That's the, but you know, I just, sorry, I don't mean to laugh. I just feel like tax forms are like not really the criteria of job. Right, like I don't know. I never know what to put on those things. I'm like, right. I have because there's right. a lot of us who do a lot of different things, yeah. and I feel like you're very much in that category. Yeah. You like, you kind of get known for the one thing, and so I've always thought, oh, you're a comic, but right. like getting to know you, yeah, I'm no. like, oh, you you write, you do all these other things. Like there's, no. a, it's a. I would definitely say that I am comedic in almost all areas of my yeah of my professional life. Um, saying that I'm a comic or a comedian is is difficult because there are a lot of I mean stand-up comedy is a very specific art form yeah I'm sure you appreciated that while listening to Cameron Esposito yeah oh for sure who who makes a study of it yeah. do you know what I mean um uh I um I, I definitely am a writer I can say that for sure saying I'm an actor is challenging really because I've not trained in acting yeah. and my limits are apparent very <laughs> yeah. quickly um uh, and but they're all the like I want I just sort of followed my nose into a career that is as surprising to me as it would be to anybody else. I did not expect to be on television. I don't. I'm not really an on camera look, but I went on the Daily Show and it worked. And um, and then off of that, I auditioned for a series of Apple computer ads and got the uh, national ad campaign, which completely transformed my life completely. Wait, you, was that really? That? Wait, was that really you? Yeah, I'm totally picturing that, and I feel like, am I superimposing you, or are you no, actually? I'm a PC. That was you. So that is truly my. What's interesting is that is by I'm far sorry that you're by a PC. orders of magnitude. That is. <laughs> that the, was huge. The thing that that you know more eyeballs than any other. Okay, thing. So, so. But you wouldn't necessarily know that it was me. Yeah, no, but I those, that ago. campaign was huge. Yes. Like, I very much remember that, and I remember everyone trying to copy it because it was so successful. Yes, but um, so it was the greatest thing to ever happen to me, <laughs> more than my wife and children. <laughs> it's okay; they'll never hear this. Um, the so were you auditioning? How did you get that then? If it was a situation where I had been on the Daily Show, uh, you know, they brought me in to be a contributor to play their resident expert. Yeah. So the, the, the job was, and, and this is something that I came up with, with Ben Carlin, who was the executive producer at the time and really who brought me into the show. You know, they were, they were doing a, a, a pastiche on a, a form of news magazine TV shows, which had already become extinct by the, you know, whatever year it was, 2005 that I went on the, as a guest, 2006. Like it was, when it was developed in the 90s, it was a parody of like, um, uh, not not even Nightline, but like 2020 or yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah, know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. Like those those anchored news magazine shows. Yeah. Um, and by the mid 2000s, it it wasn't really resembling any version of the news as we actually see it, because it be had become John's show. It was just the John show. But one of the things I noticed that was happening 
on cable news um, was that uh, any there was such um, so many many hours to fill that almost anyone could come on and pr- pretend to be an expert on something. They would just say, this person is an expert yeah. on whatever. And like, if you had done it one time, you were the expert and you were the right. voice of authority. Yeah. And so that was my job. I was going to be the resident expert on any topic where you would call in a professor. I would be the person who was the expert in that. And it really, again, like in, in ways that none of us articulated to each other or ourselves, really, you know, now seems like oh yeah the whole joke was um i'm a white man so obviously i'm an expert yeah on it like you know like yeah which it worked very well yeah like yeah it was the whole thing was a big actually long before that was a yeah i mean like yeah absolutely and and it worked really well and it's this interesting thing we got into it we were up so late last night and just talking about i got into a big debate about south park randomly at three in the morning which was unpleasant with whom we can bleep it out oh it was with mike Uh uh-huh yeah mike eagle mike eagle which was is also a guest one of our guests yes um it, delightful and lovely and also just I wrong don't about want south park yeah right um but it, it, it was also a very pleasant conversation in the way you do with when you're debating mm-hmm. with people you respect and right. like um but you know it's it's one of the you know like it got me thinking about comedy in terms of like you know not all comedy lands like your intention like because because whenever we have these conversations it's about like what's the author's intent and what's the creator's intent and like does it land like you can you can demonstrate sexism without critiquing it, right? Mm-hmm. You can just be like, this is a thing in the world, right? Yeah. Um, where people are like, no, but it's critiquing it because it's showing it. I was like, not necessarily. And I feel like that, um, from what I remember of those segments, like it was so blatantly clear that it was critiquing that concept, right? It was yeah. being like, it was very intentionally poking fun at this. And insofar as it had a, a kind of, cultural critical agenda it was it was critiquing false expertise or the right. the, the the tarnished coin of expertise which and kind the, and of the, inherently but the gendered and the racial element of it i was not yeah actually, i was not awake enough at that time to appreciate that other than on some intuitive level yeah and as i was i was i was just thinking about what i had just said incorrectly that like the um, sometimes the critique com- can come out naturally without you really realizing it, right. um, which is rare. Like that is so, yeah. so rare that it, like it's almost by accident you tripped into like, oh, I did a sexist critique. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that just by way of how you look and doing that. Yeah. 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 And so yes. but uh, so quick answer to your question. Yes. Yeah, I uh, uh, no, I uh, it went to a much more interesting place. I'm going back to my resume. <laughs> I'm sorry. But so that the, it is not no longer hanging there. Uh, I was on The Daily Show every other week, I think, or once a week, for starting in January of 06. And in March, I was just asked to come in and audition for this series of ads, and they described the concept. And I'm like, and I, and I use Apple stuff, so like, yeah, I'll do it. You know, I, I, it'll be a funny story to go in and audition for an ad campaign and not get the job, you know, sure. but I did get the job. And here you are. It ruined the story, <laughs> but, <laughs> except for me. <laughs> and Perfect. it was the, you know, the, the campaign went on for almost four years do you get apple products for life no what a no crappy deal you got Ooh, no i didn't <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> it was i mean i yeah. say with great genuineness if that's a word sure, genuineness-ity. uh it was <laughs> is that a word <laughs> sure it was cre- you know, op- financially and an, an, an alarmingly disorienting boon for someone who just a few years before had been writing about cheese for a men's magazine which is i thought was a pretty hot gig frankly <laughs> <laughs> but it was no way to raise a family do you know what i mean sure yeah so but then also creatively and just in terms of strangeness of life yeah yeah you know it was just this unbelievable fun and wonderful experience so that i miss every day i really I, i'm ready to go the commercial or oh, the yeah. daily show yeah no, the Daily Show I missed too, but that was that was that was hard work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, like the Apple thing was pure fun, pure fun. I mean, it was long hours, and I gave it my all. Yeah. But before I, you know, before I stepped into the first shot, and I remember the first setup for the Apple ads, it struck me as like, oh, this is the my on camera experience had been limited to sitting down with John and talking. Yeah. Like, I, this is the first time I'd been standing up. And then it would be a, a year before I was. I did a a really 
ill-advised cameo on Battlestar Galactica, which was my what? dream. Yeah. Okay, I kind of, I so I might oh. now need to just go in blind interviewing people because yeah. this is amazing to me. Yeah. Okay, tell me. Well, uh, in I two, definitely watched that show several in times. In 2000, I think I shot it in 2008. It came out in 2009. But the, by then I was two years into the Apple ads. Okay. And I was most noticeable for them. Um, you know, and it was, I I was as close to a fa- a famous as a, I'm mean, almost a real famous person. Like, almost, yeah. Like stopped in airports consistently. <laughs> Were they like, hey, are you a PC? Yeah. Or they would say, you look like that guy in the commercial. I'm like, well, I, I, I am that guy. And the guy would go, hmm. That's... <laughs> That's funny, but you really do look like him. Good luck. Like, <laughs> stuff like weird, mind blowing stuff like yeah. that, and just all kinds. And you know, the the fact that the reason that I have so many like uh, so many jobs with, and then qualification, you know, like asterisks to all those jobs, is that I've always just l- loved having weird adventures. Yeah. That's why I wanted to write and write for magazines because it was a way to explore the world and get a little money for it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. This so totally this was this was the that. weirdest yeah. of adventures, like all of us, yeah. you know, being being stopped, like being, you know, sent, you know, w- once the campaign took off, you know, they were extremely I mean, they they were very, very generous with both me and Justin and the director. Like they 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 treated us extremely well. And I say that not because like, yeah, we earned it, but because like they they were good about it. Yeah. yeah. Like, so we got to go to Disneyland with a VIP tour guide, my family and I. Like, Aww. And they paid for it. Like, yeah, that's awesome. Because Steve Jobs was alive at that time, sat on the Disney board or whatever. You know, like yeah. it was just uh, insane access to this to this world that Which, I did not expect ever yeah, access and I, to. You know, like that's nice to have that. And also, but that is also one of these things where um, the more, I, like, I don't want to say, fa- like rich people get free shit yeah. all the time. Yeah. And I went to... Um, and so there's two two things that I'm thinking about here is one is that when you are on TV for any period of time or in the press for any period of time, people think that you're just like set, like your life is set right. financially. Right. You've got like this, this huge career. And I'm like, no, that's not the way this works no, right. at all. Yeah. Um, but also uh, just sort of Except like in dip- my case. Right. Cause you're <laughs> just, you know, rocking. Well, I actually don't know what you're doing. I'm assuming you're doing. I don't know either. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like, I've like been adjacent to famous people sometimes. Yeah. So like the Time Gala for the Time 100, oh, yeah, yeah. which is fucking weird yeah. shit. I That's never a, was invited to that. No, because yeah. you weren't an influential, you weren't one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Not. But I guess who was? was you. I was. Right. <laughs> I say Anita, that Anita, real people, Sarkeesian. Real people, Sarkeesian. Um, I say that with the, like, that's bonkers that I yeah. was ever on this list. But what like, a great adventure. Sure. I'm yeah. not going to say no to it. Right. But so you, I'm in, I have a million stories, but the reason I brought this up is because you, the, like, the swag bag that you walk away from sure. with that thing oh, was yeah. full of so much stuff. Yeah. Just because, like, people want to put their, uh, their products in front of famous people who might get caught in a paparazzi photo wearing their fucking underwear or whatever. Or nowadays right? might put it in their Instagram. Yeah, exactly. Whatever, yeah. Um, and it's just these moments of like, I was sitting next to a very famous TV star who was like telling me these stories about their life. Um, and I was like, it just was this moment of like, you are so rich that you can't comprehend the world. Like, right. you can't understand that oh. what you're saying to me right now is, like, leaps and bounds it's beyond a, anything I could yeah. ever imagine. Right. I mean, the... the, the it the, is a totally different the, world. The fact, the fact is that, you know, and I don't say... I mean, it's a complicated subject, uh, but the life change... I mean, yeah, I got to go on a lot of adventures. Got to go to Disneyland for free. I got to... You know, with The Daily Show, I would go to the Emmys, you know, and, like wander around backstage with the you know most famous people in the world one, one i think the, there was the last year that john that john that uh john went to the emmys and won f- for that year for you know best variety show or whatever it was and he invited everyone up on stage which is normally not what happens because yeah. normally it's just the the producers of the show but this time he knew this is the last time he was going to be there so he's like everyone get up on stage and so we all went up on stage it was very meaningful you know, and the presenter was LL Cool J, <laughs> and and then after John said his words, we all have to walk off stage to do the next thing, and LL Cool J just turns to me and shakes my hand and goes, "Congratulations, man!" I'm like, <laughs> "LL Cool J, you got like, the wrong guy." <laughs> but you look like the right guy. 
See? I, I just happened to be standing no. next to LL Cool J at that time. Yeah. But it's these weird moments yeah. that, like, I think that the public would see that and be like, that's totally normal that you would be in that situation well, because yeah, they've no. seen you on TV well, and you're I, like, what the fuck is happening? I know, right. I, I, uh, <laughs> I uh, I I definitely was part of the team. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I'm not. I don't want to downplay my own contributions, but they were small, obviously, compared to many other people. Yeah. And, and but to me, it was just the epitome of like, oh, this has almost gone too far. This is zealot <laughs> life that I'm leading. Like, the LL Cool I, J I just have to take it down. Is congratulating. This is a little weird. Like, <laughs> yeah. and similarly, like you know, my agent would say, you know, what do you want to do? Like, you want to so. Yes, in the first year after the the Daily Show Apple computer commercial one-two punch that kind of shot me into this weird other world, and I got, you know, a big agency, and they're presuming like, oh, well, he's a comedic actor. He wants to have a TV show. He wants to do this. I'm like, oh, not really. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, I, when they offered me the job for the Apple ads, <clears throat> they didn't offer it for me at first. I auditioned twice. They had a, I had a callback, and then they wanted me to come in for a third audition to read with Justin, who I believe had been cast at that point. And the, but the, the, that, was, that read was going to happen in L.A. Had you never done auditions and stuff no, before this? So never this, you're it. walking in just like, what is going on yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I'd done, I had I, I, I'd never really gone through a formal audition yeah. process. Uh, and, and so I was just like, this, you know, when I got the call, I'd, I'd just done a comedy show or some kind of reading or something in you know, New York where I live. And I got the call saying um well they 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 really liked your second audition and they wanted you to come read with justin the the guy that they've cast for the ad um uh, in la tomorrow um <laughs> cool and and uh, you know they were going to fly like they were going to fly me out to do it, it wasn't like i had to sure of course. buy my way still but you know i was like oh this joke has gone too far <laughs> like, I think, I think I have a lunch scheduled with someone tomorrow and I definitely need to drop my daughter off at school and pick her up. Like I yeah. can't. And I, you know, I had to talk with Cassie Evashevsky, who w- was then and still is my agent, like in a longtime friend. By the time I was like, Cassie, this has gotten at it. Like, I'm not an actor and I'm not. And I and I don't have an act like an actor has to have that kind of flexibility in their lives. That's not built into my life. Also, I'm not a child. I'm in my 30s. I have a family. I can't just fly to L.A. tomorrow to keep this joke going. <laughs> <laughs> this really good story <clears throat> right. for the future. Yeah. And she said, all right, well, I'll talk to them. She said, well, good news. Uh, the, the, how about the day after tomorrow? And I'm like, no, I, I can't do this. I can't do like the, You amazing. have to. At least you have to understand what my limits are. And I said, there isn't like. I'm not going to be irresponsible. There's a number, like if I were to get the job, there's money that I would take, that I would have to take, that I, will allow me to say to my family, I'm going away tomorrow. Yeah. And and uh, but but I think we just need to let them know that this is not this isn't for me. And then she called back. She said, Well, they would you fly there the day after tomorrow if they just offered you the job? What? Yeah. Shut up. No. And I was like, Oh, well, how much are they paying? And she told me, I'm like, I, I guess I have to. Yeah. And Wait, I was so, so you didn't have to do the last audition? No. Because I'm, you're like, I have kids. <laughs> I did Because I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the power of naivete can be really amazing. And I would not, and I've tried many times since then to pull that same stunt. Yeah, it didn't Where work. I would just be, and it never worked. Yeah, it no. It didn't work. It didn't work. And what if it had, I mean, I need it seriously, if it had worked, I mean, if it if it had gone wrong and they just said, all right, well, we'll move on. We've got another I thing. I mean, I would. I, I wouldn't, I don't know that I would know what I had missed out on. Right. But, or the fullness of what I would have missed out on. But when I think of that, I what I, what I gained by taking the job, yeah. it really, and I, I've, it, you know, it's it's guided a lot of decisions since then. Where it's like if something's scary or inconvenient uh, or just feels wrong or uh, like something doesn't feel right about it and you want to say no, sometimes that's the correct instinct. Yeah. But sometimes it's not. And you you need to really You need to figure out what is like, and this is so woo-woo, but like I've spent a lot more time over the last couple of years being like, I need to trust my gut. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and, and whenever I don't, 
it's always the wrong choice. It always is. And it's a thing that is now kind of a joke with my staff when it comes to like hiring or making decisions. Right. When I'm like, I don't feel good about this, but I'm going to do it anyway. So they're like, why? You literally do this every time. <laughs> Stop doing that. Yeah, it's really hard. Um, and it is really hard because you're like, what is what is the feeling of fear versus I just know this is wrong. Yeah. Right? But I think that there's something to... But like, my gut was telling me this is wrong. Yeah. This is This whole thing is wrong. Well, I think there's and my gut was wrong. To, yeah, there's something to not knowing how systems work and being like, no, like because right. you're so naive about it. Like once you're now that you're in it or you understand the space better, you're like, oh, I understand how you go and how you communicate the agent and this and that. But like before then, you're like, uh, no, like and you do yeah. stuff like that. And and for me, that happened with um, like different things, like um, when I'm asked to write an article for a magazine. And they're like, here are the edits, and I push back, and I'm like, no, I'll just pull it. Like, I don't care. My my, right. I have my other career that I'm doing, and right. this is just extra. And it gives me that, like, it really is a level of privilege of me being like, forget it. Yeah. If, you, if it's not working out in a way that feels good for me, where most people don't have that opportunity exactly. or don't, you know, and vice versa. Of like, we just don't know better than yeah. being like, why would you, why would you give me a shitty headline for my article? Oh, because that's what editors do, right? right. But I didn't know that at the time. And I right. would like cause a huge ruckus being like, this right. is awful. Why the fuck did you do this? Right. Um, so it's weird the, because I feel like the like new voices in these spaces can bring a lot. Mm -hmm. They bring a lot of perspective and they bring a lot of like, this is not normal. And I don't know why you've all been doing it this way for so long. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, but absolutely. you're also kind of annoying when you do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, some some people it's it's interesting within just how the, how Hollywood, for lack of a better term, works. There is a way of doing business. And if you buck that way. You and just in terms of like, oh, he doesn't want to audition for this thing. Like it's uh, this is a little in the weeds, but it's like there some sometimes that gets you more credibility, and sometimes that just labels you as a pain. Yeah, and you don't really know when that's going to happen. And right? I'll tell you when it, it, it labels you as a pain. It's you know, no, it labels you as a as a cool rebel who should be taken seriously if you're making other people money. Yeah. Then, then you have credibility. Yeah, but yeah, if you're, yeah. if like, and you know, I would say that s s you know, since those days, since the Apple ads ended, I've been, f and because of the platform that I got through those things, I've been able to develop a really wonderful, rewarding career for myself as a, as a performer, very occasionally as an actor, uh, but now writing books again and doing this podcast and everything else, and through all of those different sources i've made a very good living for myself my family yeah yeah but not for uh, not for other people and yeah. so i'm kind of off the radar it's, uh, they won't pay attention to me again until i make somebody a lot of money yeah that makes I mean, a lot of so sense. you have to make all this money so two or three other people can make a lot of money right like it's crazy which is very much this like very interesting division in terms of you know like youtube celebrities and podcast celebrities and like yeah. independent like an independent fame for right. lack of a better word in terms right. of like there's you can be a really successful podcaster and never have an agent and never have you know like right. most people don't or you might never be on a network right? right you might be doing it independently and so I think there are different ways that like when I was growing up were, there were not opportunities to exactly. do um, in terms of being public and being a performer or being a critic or whatever it might be right there were very limited modes of doing in that. terms of being a public person yeah, it's a very. I I would imagine it's, uh, and I think that it's a very empowering time yeah. because you know this was true and part of the utopian internet gospel even in the early two thousands before there were phones put a, the internet in everyone's hand and the, the internet was still mostly you know relatively affluent white dudes and some women using the internet and thinking of the dreams of the future or whatever. But this idea that like, oh yeah, well, you know, there, the barrier to entry to having an audience is much, much, much lower. And so that's going to be the utopia. It, it only really blossomed once the, you know, once Steve Jobs put the internet in the hands of everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And uh, not that an iPhone isn't an expensive gadget, but it freed the internet from the, um, the province of desktop computers, uh, which had where where it began, right? And right, right. desktop computers was were not in every home, yeah. You know, and they and, and we're still seen as yeah. a kind of part of nerd culture, kind of part of affl obviously affluent culture. It was a, a, a self limiting 
world of the internet until 2007 and then 2007 suddenly it's in all these different hands and the hands are different colors and they're different you know different voices different yeah people. and you know the thing that there is there's the utopian dream of democratizing the internet right and there are you know we this is not the time for this in this at all but right. you know the the idea that like there are definitely voices that have risen up that otherwise wouldn't have risen Absolutely. up both in terms of like great social justice progress and also Monstrous, fascism and yeah. white supremacy of and all course. that shit um like people finding their communities whether right. it, in all of the ways that that happens right. right um but the thing that that upsets me i guess uh is the like the corporatization of it all, right? How like, you know, the internet could have served as a democratizing platform for real, but instead it's like corporations coming in and being like, well, how do we just take our old school style yeah. and stick it online, right? Yeah. Stuffing ads in things or yeah. not paying writers or, you know, like right. all the shit that happens it's with true. that. It's true, it's true. so like there, there is more space, but there's also such a like replicating the, the old guard systems because we don't know how else to do it. And there's not, the experiments that are happening aren't on a big scale right. or you ha or it ends up like fucking Twitter, right? right? Where it's kind of a disaster. Corporation's gonna corp. Corporation's gonna corp. <laughs> yes, I, with the new, no, t new t-shirts. I mean, yeah, there, 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 there is no utopia without dystopia, you know, and they're, they're usually the same. But I, I'm thinking specifically of like YouTube creators or people with podcasts who are able to, you know, now more easily than ever get some money for yeah. that feed. And that's something that is their own. And I mean, I think of Tavi Gevinson is incre this incredible entrepreneur who also came into it and just disrupted everything. Mm. And she's so amazing. But you know, she no one, no one was ever going to tell Tavi Gevinson. No, no, this is how we do things. Yeah, because Tavi Gevinson, she's, if she's she like, even I'm bothers, doing it my way. What's that? She's like, I'm doing it my way. Yeah, she's like, I've I've already been doing it my way. And the more things you have that you're doing your way, that are yours and yours alone, and you and if you can get revenue from it, all the better. That's I mean, that's as that's privilege. Yeah, right. That's yeah. a lot. That's what allows you to say, n change the headline on that thing, or I'm out. Yeah, and totally. I. You know, I stumbled into, you know, I learned early on as a freelance magazine writer that the whole trick is diversify your income streams. Try to have get money coming from as many different places because it won't last. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And it never occurred to me both by the necessity of that job and my own interest sort of, uh, I, I, I was, you know, my, my own sort of dilettante -ish fascination with all these different things. I was never going to just have one job with one income stream. Yeah, yeah. And when you have one job with one income stream, that's when someone asks you to do something and everything in your body says no, but you say yes anyway. Sure. And, and the, that's where, you know, that's, that's why Harvey Weinstein, <laughs> you know what I Ugh, mean? Like yeah. that's part of, that's part of it. Sure. You know, it's like, so, and the, the thing I was going to say is like, yeah, mm -hmm those first couple of years and they're asking what do you want to do what do you want to do and I'm like I don't know nothing I'm not an actor but I would like to be on Battlestar Galactica because I like that a lot <laughs> oh right I forgot we were talking and about Battlestar, that well yeah and, the, and then you know they, I just down. I just wanted to be like in the background of a scene and just say I I or something but like Jane Ep Espenson who yeah. do you know her yeah I do she's so amazing and she was the writer on that episode and we had we had met before and and she like took lines from an a a, a working Canadian actor and split the role into two and gave me half the role so that I would have something to do. What did you do? I was a space brain surgeon <laughs> Descri <laughs> describing That's how amazing. Starbucks husband got shot in the head. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and the, that, that was a humiliating experience, but fun. Cool. But the, for all of that, like wild, like this is how, like how different is my life now? How surreal is it? None of it compares to the surreality of being financially stable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I write about this in my book, Vacation Land, available now at all bricks and mortar and internet bookshops. But it, it's, it, you know, I, I, I came from an affluent middle class background. I mean, both my parents came from working class families in Philadelphia and central Massachusetts, but they, they were the, they went to college, they got degrees, they got, they got it together at a time where there was a middle class, you know, and I I didn't have to worry for a lot growing up or anything really. 
But once I had set out on a course of I'm going to be a freelance writer and there, it's not like they could just bankroll me. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, and particularly once I had a family, all of a sudden there was a lot of big question marks about how, how I could continue to make money and um, uh, 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 getting a big, big, big paycheck from Apple put me into the realm of what I consider to be like grown-up money. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I'm a grown-up and I can I could get a house. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like an, an inconceivable idea. Um but what really I noticed was oh, I'm I'm not anxious and sad all the time. Like the financial stability yeah. helped with that. Oh, it was, yeah. it's it was emba- it's embarrassing. And you th- and you know you don't appreciate or I, I think we don't like to talk about how uh, wealth um, is probably the most powerful antidepressant on earth. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to, obviously people who suffer with mental health issues, it doesn't matter how, how much yeah, m- yeah, money yeah. they have, but the anxiety of not. So what you're saying is money does buy you happiness. It totally does. <laughs> it to- well, I mean, it and buys I- you the conditions for happiness, which are, a moment without worry. Yeah. I a moment like to take a breath, to plan for the future, to be generous. Yeah. And all those things. I mean, it's it's the shameful it buys you truth. Choices. It buys you It buys you space and choices. Yeah. And it allows you to say no to things yeah. that don't feel right to you because you don't have it's a that that's the the privilege of wealth. And it's such and I'm brought it up because because you wanted to brag about how you're a rich white dude. I, n- no. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> Sorry. No, but I thought you might want to hear my perspective. I, <laughs> uh, but I bring it up because it was a, it was a shameful realization um, because there is so much of a myth in our culture that money doesn't buy you happiness. There are a lot of myths around wealth that are designed to make you feel uh, better about income inequality, basically. Yeah. And that's on purpose. I was going to say, some of this is, is, like, this is such a difficult conversation because, cla- you know, uh, class is such a, it is, it's talked about, but also not. Like, we, we, like, even I forget to include class when I talk about, like, race, gender, sexuality. Like, right. Class is a huge fucking part of that. Of course. And I feel like we don't have these open, frank conversations about financial stability and access and all that. So, like, we do and we what I feel like we do and I'm just saying that we don't because I'm not having them at the moment but you know like I it's I'm even having a little bit of discomfort right now having Mm -hmm. like talking to you about this and being like cool so you made money cool right like that's everyone else didn't no I know and and I and I'm not saying that in that you aren't aware of that but there's a little bit of tension for me in terms of what is that mean right like it's not like that's that's the problem is not everyone has access to to this to 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 have a career that can pay them well or access to buying a home and that sort of thing and right like, no i mean how do you, that's how do you the, navigate that that's space? that's the, the you know the the work part of the work that we have to do yeah um is to uh i mean you know yeah, I'm not saying I'm definitely not saying this to brag. I'm saying no, this to, it doesn't. It, it doesn't feel that it's way. It's a at shameful all. confession how un, how I didn't appreciate um, <clears throat> the background anxiety of never mind poverty, just for me financial inst- instability. Yeah, you know, and and the the level of anxiety that people are living with every day, and that anxiety, in my opinion, is maintained for a political reason. You know, the the Republican Party. D- doesn't care about spending, government spending, no. obviously. Yeah, clearly. But they want to take away Medicaid for sure, and and, and they may yeah. trick themselves into thinking that that's because it's a, a socialism or some yeah. ideological purpose. But these policies, and and I I I I, I, lay it, I would have in the past I might have said, well, not all Republicans are not all conservatives, but now I have to lay it at the feet of the Republican Party because of the w- the openness of, of their uh, 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 vile shamelessness yeah. in the past year. Do you remember under um, the, I think it was the second Bush election, the Joe the Plumber thing? Yeah. Right, where the Republicans have done such a good job of making poor white folks yeah. think like they can achieve high like that the american dream that they right. can actually be rich and so that they would actually vote for folks who would benefit yeah the rich. vote aspirationally yeah and you're like, like i'll give you're a, i'll give you a never... billionaire a tax cut because maybe someday i'll be a billionaire yeah and you're like but that's never literally never going to happen right that's never going to happen for right. you um and and, it's, and, so it's and not, not only because it's statistically unlikely but also on on purpose 
these social programs that provide stability are they're in the crosshairs yeah. because anxious, scared voters are easier to control. Yeah. And, you know, Joe, Joe the Pl- I, I don't remember that guy's name. And it's, I'll, I don't I'll I leave just his, remember he was Joe the Plumber. I'll leave his thing out of yeah. you know. But all the, all the folks from working class families like my moms and dads, you know, who, who you know, very loving family, but grew up in a tradition of casual racism, you know, like tri- sort of eth- ethno tribalism within their their uh, neighborhoods in in Fitchburg and Philadelphia. Yeah, they're scared. I mean, they're scared, and they've pulled they've pulled together what they can pull together financially. But the idea that someone might be getting something for free is infuriating. Right, right. And because they're scared, and scared, and people who live in anxiety can be provoked into not voting at all or voting the same. But if if you if you had a, if we had a situation with, and you know guaranteed income or if we were able to as a society get rid of that anxiety by providing a safety net that allowed people to take a breath to save i mean we had this system in place to some degree if for white families you know uh, after world war 2 where you you could buy a home you know there were the gi bill was helping people get educations helping people moving into the middle class and then the upper middle class and having that be enough was a wonderful system and and because when people have that stability they be, tend to become yeah. liberal like yeah. they tend to start well, thinking less in a defensive crouch and start thinking you know they have time to explore their interests they have time to go take continuing education sure. they have time and, to you know what i mean like and i'm glad that you stipulated that it was white families because there's such a, a history of like the gi bill not being useful for men right. of color who were in that because they yeah. couldn't get into schools or they couldn't get access to mortgages exactly or whatever yeah yeah, yeah yeah no 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 um, I, I mean but also right. there is a thing that like the richer you get the more you hold on to your money right where you sort of like buckle down like the statistics around charity and like giving right is that people with less money actually give more than because um statistically speaking than right people with money which is like you know it's that it's that really annoying saying where folks um what did they say it was like i'm i'm socially liberal but fiscally conservative and i'm just like fuck off right like i hear that a lot from people who got who made money in the field. Right. like like you become you com- become republican in your 40s but you were like a liberal in your 20s right. and that kind of bullshit right. where you like buckle down but well yeah no if you've made if you've made money it, you are inclined to believe the myth that you deserve to have made money. Right. Which, without thinking about all the privileges that got you to the place that you got. Yeah. Right? And I'm telling you right now, I I waltzed into an audition that I was not supposed <laughs> yes. to get. This whole podcast you know, I is won, about I how won like, the lottery. white dude gets yeah. career by like not doing anything. <laughs> not that you didn't. Of course you worked. But the, there was a lot of right. like – I was. we were talking to Amy Berg and she was talking about how she like – like her story of how she broke into Hollywood is really funny because she's like, I, um, it, there is luck involved, but there's also the persistence for her of oh, like, yeah. I literally sent the weirdest care packages over and over again to people I wanted to work for. Yeah. And it just worked out that like they finally yeah. accepted her in. But my mom, my mom, you know, when <laughs> my mom was no longer alive, uh, when she was alive and she, and she wanted to move, we lived in Brookline, Massachusetts. And she had her idea. She had a street that she wanted to live on, and it was a bunch of te- you know row houses, right, all together, uh, two blocks worth. And she wrote a handwritten note um, to everyone on the street and slipped it through the door, saying, "I love your home. If you ever consider selling it, please contact me." Aww. And someone did. Really? Yeah. And that became our home. That's and hilarious. It, she she Good and she her. had incredible. Catholic school penmanship. Which <laughs> I still... So that, that's why it worked, is because she wrote it. Well, well, no, but I mean, it, it. And I had learned through working in the literary agency and getting a lot of um, garbage manuscripts over the transom every day that I had to read and process. Like you would think that that would make you feel dispirited as a creative person, because <clears throat> there's so many people who are out there trying. But in fact, it was inspiring because you realize most people can't do it. Like that, most of this is not dreck. Yeah. Um, and then you would also see like the things that you passed on, um, go get published someplace else, even though you know that it's not the greatest, but you appreciate that like talent is an amazing thing, but persistence is almost more important. Yeah. More persistent people without talent will succeed than talented people without persistence by far. Yeah. So. So be persistent, aka annoying to people. Yeah. Until you get what you want. Right. And, but don't, also. Don't actually do that. <laughs> 
Yeah. But you know, th- that was one of the things that we had talked about earlier um, with Amy is that like the the line between persistence and annoyance, right? Like how to navigate that, right? As you know, like it, it's a tr- it's a tricky line, and, yeah. and it's it is very personal to who you're talking to and what their levels of well, yeah. of, uh, of receiving that have good penmanship. Ha- yes, bring, you've heard it here first. Bring bring, bring some pleasure into your nudging. Yeah, yeah. You know, do more favors than ask for favors. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, and the other thing I, I had to tell my cousin rather awkwardly is, you know, your parents will tell you it never hurts to ask. It always hurts to ask. It doesn't mean you can't. You don't you have to ask in this in this it. life. You do have to, but beware that you're spending down some goodwill and some credibility. Yeah. So you make sure that the ask is worth it, and also make sure that the ask is clear and not open ended and. It's yeah. something that the person could comfortably say no to if if that's where they're at or whatever. That is really good advice. Well, thank you. you. Know. <laughs> there was one manuscript that came across my desk when I was a literary agent. It was such a piece of garbage. Some fantasy dreck called the name of the something. I can't even remember <laughs> what it was, but it, I was just like, no, no, don't get me wrong. I did my due diligence. I read the first. 700 pages barely got into it stay tuned <laughs> and then just, for our next guest and then i just threw, <laughs> we literally we li- it was like 1984 we literally had a memory hole with a fire at the bottom and i just went <laughs> straight down there I, I don't know what ever happened to that guy <laughs> but i hope oh. he's okay i hope he's okay Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much uh, for having where, me. Bye. Where can people I, find your stuff? What do you want to what do you want people to throw so, money at you so, for? So well, no one needs to throw money at me. <laughs> well, wait a minute. <laughs> you want them to buy your book? It's been well. I I, I hope that people will they enjoy can rent my it book. They from the library. Yes, rent it. You don't rent. You borrow. You can borrow it from the library. Yes. I would love people to enjoy my book. And you know, I would I would say, uh, hi everyone. My name's John Hodgman. I'm not on TV that much anymore. <laughs> uh, I. I uh, the premise of this conversation was yes, I did make a big chunk of change from Apple Computer, and I've saved most of it wisely. But uh, that's been a long time ago. I still have some years left and and mouths to feed. So I will go ahead and say what I, I, every creative person I think should, you know, I, I recommend for every creative person is like, if you like a thing and can pay for it, please pay for it. And please pay for it in the way that they ask you to pay for it, because that's probably the way that is most meaningful to them. So uh, with that in mind, even though you already are sitting at home going, why should I give John Hodgman one more red cent? <laughs> I'm not literally a deranged millionaire. That was a character that I played. <laughs> Judge John Hodgman is on the Maximum Fun Network. We have a pledge drive. I don't know when this is coming out, but we have a pledge drive uh, in the end of March, beginning of April, that supports all of the shows on Maximum Fun, not just mine. And it's a great a great podcast network. And I, I hope you will take a listen to some of the amazing podcasts on that, including a great podcast about books that I just guested on called Reading Glasses, which was total fun. Oh, cool. Um, amazing podcast. So you can go check out Judge John Hodgman and other podcasts at Maximum Fun. My book, Vacation Land, is coming out in paperback in May um, and is available in hardcover right now at all those places. Um, you can go to the library and read a few pages and see if it's worth your time and money. I hope you enjoy it. Um, and uh, you can donate to that library if you... <laughs> If you, <laughs> I feel like I put you on the spot, and now you're like, here are no, all the no, ways no. you can give money to other people. No, no, no. you can donate <laughs> yeah. to the Friend Memorial Library in Brooklyn, Maine. That would be my request, if you don't mind. Aww. And then, uh, uh, yeah, watch for me. Not in Pitch Perfect Three. They did not bring me back for that one. How dare they? Pitch Perfect Two. Did anyone watch Pitch Perfect Three? Yeah. God. Yes. Many. <laughs> Sorry. All the humans. All, all the humans. Oh it. yes. And you weren't in it. Uh, no. And I don't know, I don't know what else. I'm not really going to the, the podcast and the books right Great. now. Yeah. I think that that is a sufficient entryway into current day John Hodgman. Well, what a pleasure. It's so great to uh, talk with you. Lovely having you on. Thank you. <laughs>